Well, now we're into the riser. Not a whole lot in this box. Or this drawer. But a few things of interest, I think. The usual magnifier glass, a, a Sterrett center head. Now this is a nice Sterrett square. It's called a double square and it comes with the extra blades. I'm not sure I ever used it, but I I do like it. Well, just in case the Russians come. Got one of those, but now nah, it's been fired. This little thing here, a map measure. Did you ever see one of these? You know, if you wanted to know how far it is from point A to point B, you you just track this along the crooked road. A little bit of a wheel here, a traveler wheel, and it would tell you how how many miles. Now we got Google Earth. Pretty much makes this thing worthless. And you know what? The lens just fell out of it, so it's even more worthless. I guess that's a novelty item you bought in one of those little catalogs that sold junk. Got all kinds of 12-inch uh, uh, blades here. Uh, Sterrett. I believe they're all Sterrett. See how much nicer the satin chrome is than the, the old plain steel. Down on this end, well, there's my old hunting knife. I bought that when I was 16. I thought I was Jim Bowie when I carried that thing hunting. Oh, I loved that thing. Made by Western. Leather handle. Wow. I was hoping I'd run into a bear so I could use it. But I only saw a squirrel. Uh, in the Sterrett box, we got a depth mic, but actually it's a Shear Tomiko, with, along with the extra rods. Shear Tomiko, uh, I don't believe they make them anymore, but it was a quality product, and uh, many of the micrometers and precision tools that Sears sold were made by Shear Tomiko. Up in Minnesota, I think. There's some kind of little square device. Not sure what it is. And these uh, fit into Sterrett rulers. I forgot what they're called. Fit into the blade. Something to do with keys. I don't know. I don't have that quite right. Need to look it up. So that's all there is in that drawer. We're getting down to the bottom of box number one. Got a bunch of V-blocks here, including a nice matched pair along with the clamps, but I don't see a name on them. In the green box, there is a set of jaws for a Jacob's Chuck replacement jaws. You know I'll never install those. I should throw them out. Here's something I bought at a garage sale. I was going to repair it the second I got home, but it, you know how those jobs go. Someone had cut this off and made a rather nice sized uh, center finder because 98 percent of the time you only need a, a short blade and they're not a 12 inch blade. Now here's a couple of uh, protractor heads on uh, Sterrett rulers and uh, they're, uh, they're different designs and uh, Keith has shown these also but uh, both of them have their purposes but notice that the blade comes uh, through the center of this head whereas on this one it comes off to the side. When I want to do accurate uh, measuring of angles, this is the type of protractor I prefer. I don't like those little brown and sharp ones with a vernier because it's, they're too hard to read. Moving on down, we've got an inspection mirror. This is a brass lap, if you know what lapping is, uh, to size a hole very accurately. You use a grit. This is about a one inch lap and I have used that, or a three quarter I think, uh, for making sterling engines when I wanted a real accurate and round bore. Here's my little Skidmore optical center punch. And that was shown in some of my other videos. You know a lot of these tools were, were, look, were shown in other videos and I have hundreds of them. You need to go through all of those and, and take a look at them please. So this is a neat tool. Yeah, we got yet another magnifier here, for some reason. 
I like a nice bench block for driving out pins or uh, doing center punching. This is a steric and it is hardened. Take a look at another one I have here as well. This was under my bench and I don't see a name on this one. They're both hardened. This one's quite heavy. Here we have yet another unfinished project. I forgot what that was for even. I should throw it out. Oh, we got several uh, brand new chucks here. There's a Jacobs chuck, but it's only a 3 8 and it has a number 2 Jacobs taper. There's a nice ball bearing one, but it's only a 3 8 also. That one's threaded. This uh, dial indicator fits on that beautiful little uh, Cameron drill press that I have to check the depth, but it was in the way so I took it off. And that's about it for this drawer. And for This is box number two and it's kind of a half box. And it's a Craftsman, a Sears Craftsman. And um, I think my dad would have said it looks like something Sears made when Roebuck wasn't looking. And at one time I had this devoted uh, to uh, uh, carving tools when I was on a kick of uh, where I was going to be the world's greatest uh, wood carver and that was an ill-fated attempt and I had really no talent at all but there are still uh, some uh, tools on here left from that venture so let's go through this box starting with the top. Let's see what we got here. These are our wood chisels from that adventure I just mentioned and there's a set of Miller's Falls chisels and I believe there's five in the set. Getting a little rust on that one. Five of those. Uh, make it six. A gouge. And here's a set of uh, little bit smaller ones. And they're made by uh, Woodcraft. There's three of those. along with the original set of keys for the box. And in the back here we've got some X-Acto knives. There's a push button X-Acto knife still in the package. And a couple others still in the package. There's a little saw blade and a X-Acto handle. These uh, little fine tooth saw blades here, they're like little back saws will fit into this type of handle and these are, are really wonderful when you're cutting balsa wood or or basswood or, and making models or doing some very small work because they don't leave a burr so those are kind of nice even though they look like they're a toy. Here's my original whittling jack Parker cut whittling knife and there's a buck chisel there's only one of them for some reason We've got all kinds of little exacto handles, a whole box of them. Some exacto gouge blades. Plenty more of these. Some uh, various blades for exacto. And that's about it for the top of this box. You can see that's all woodworking related. I do use some of these in my pattern making from time to time. The next drawer also is devoted to wood carving. And uh, these uh, colored handles here are worn knives. These are really uh, uh, high quality. They're expensive too. You can loosen up the brass ferrule here and uh, it's kind of like a collet and that'll hold all of the different worn blades and they make uh, quite a variety of them. And I, I got them in different colors so I could remember which blades were in which one so I knew whether to grab the red one or the blue one. Again, that's when I was going to be a great wood carver. And I did uh, carve some uh, hound dogs and things like that, but I had to use patterns and I just, I'm not an artist. I'm just not. Uh, that's a little bit different deal there where that'll loosen up and the blade pulls out. I had to have one of everything, you know. There's some curved blades, and they, they really make some neat uh, blades that allow you to uh, curve intricate things, but 
I was uh, misinformed, uh, thinking that uh, the better tools I had, the better carvings I could make, and I suppose you could use any old pocket knife if you're really talented, and I was not along that line. There's another knife of some kind. Three more exacto knives. And all kinds of exacto blades. And on this side, boy, those are tiny little blades. Exacto, exacto. Uh, Warren, Warren Tool Company, and I bought these over in Moline at uh, the Woodcraft Shop some years ago. These are all brand new. I always made it a point of throwing away blades or any other cutting tool when they were dull unless I was going to sharpen it, but these were priced so uh, why would you sharpen them? Because they came, uh, you know, very good. They were sharp w when I bought them. Some chisels and so on are, have to be sharpened after they're purchased. They make no claim about them being sharpened and all kinds of other blades there and I guess that's enough. This is a machine shop video, not woodworking. Next drawer, please. Well, we got all kinds of adjustable parallels. Some of them are Lufkins and some are Sterrets. I found with some of these that uh, after they're worn out, and these came from auctions, that uh, often you couldn't get them uh, very tight. That was a disappointment to me, but these are nice when you need them. For some reason, I've got what I think is a tire depth gauge. You know, now they got wear bars and all kinds of other things in tires. You don't need them, and most people used a Lincoln penny anyway for measuring tread depth. But, and here's another little tool. I, I ha again have no idea what it is. Some kind of little blade. I should throw some of this stuff away. Also in here I have several offset screwdrivers. This type is the ratcheting type. Those are handy sometimes if I can remember where they're at. Some things are in drawers because they defy any good way of hanging them on a tool uh, panel. All kinds of tweezers for when I get that sliver. Here's some kind of weird scissors. Another tweezer, so not too much of interest in that drawer. Drawer three, can't hardly get it open. Okay, you know, I think I got more punches than Heinz has pickles, but uh, there's a couple sets of Sterrett center punches. Had to have them simply because I love Sterrett and I resharpened all of them. I even went to the effort of sharpening them on the lathe using a tool post grinder. I, that's overkill, I believe, but I did it anyway. There's two sets of those. Draftsman dividers, no value at all. Another odd punch. This is a radio crystal from left, left from when I was uh, probably eight years old. My dad had my brother and me build a little uh, uh, crystal radio set. And most people don't know what I'm talking about, but you could tune in your radio by moving your little cat's whisker on the different parts of the crystal. And some other punches. A couple more automatic center punches. Brass one here is made over the pond. These were marketed a few years ago as an escape mechanism. Uh, if your car went into the river or into a lake, well, what's the chances? And uh, the woman had uh, one of these in her console. She could poke it and uh, punch the side windows, not the windshield, because the side windows are all tempered glass, and it would break them, and she could escape, because, of course, the electric windows wouldn't work when you're underwater. Now, what is the chances of that happening? But I did talk to a couple women that said, yeah, they had to have one of those, because just in case they went in the water. Oh my gosh. There are some other center punches as well. These were also used as a burglary tool. I'm ashamed uh, to, uh, I probably shouldn't say that, to get into cars. A burglary tool. Some of you will like this drawer. It's filled full of nothing but 
pin punches and quite a large selection of them all sizes all brands all major brands you know you can't have enough pin punches and you won't find a single bent one in here either or damaged one if they are bent I throw them out and the small ones are often bent because in the desperation to get something apart this whole set came uh, at an auction <laughs> it's not really a set but somebody put them in a pencil case or whatever this is but these are all small ones all major brands doesn't that make your mouth water that's probably a hundred bucks worth if you had to buy them new because you know they're about four or five bucks a crack now for these for quality ones I'm not talking about you know what I'm talking about quality punches also this represents probably only one-fourth of the punches I own it's almost to the point where it might be a, a minor fetish for me and last but not least in box number two there's an assortment of uh, pliers down here and they're uh, every one is kind of a weird uh, pair of pliers so they're not common pliers so I'm gonna go through them if you don't like this just rapid uh, your video a little bit to get through it but some of these are major brands also this is a uh, well, I can't read it, but it's made in USA, but just a little bit of different uh, jaws to it. You, we've all seen these, but this is a particularly slender one for fine work. S.K. Wayne. Here's a nice little proto-diagonal. And yeah, tell me if you know what that is, but I'm sure it came from a factory where it was uh, a very specific purpose no name on it here's another one that's a little bit strange it looks like an insect doesn't it and it's a Utica that was a common name looks like the pincher on a dung beetle or something doesn't it hmm. these were often used in ignition sets I love uh, Bernard parallel jaw pliers and they made these in many different sizes and shapes and most of them had a little side cutter on them and some of them have smooth jaws this one has uh, serrated jaws and Bernard held the original patents on these and then was eventually bought out by Sargent which is the name you're going to see there but uh, some of them will say Bernard on them also and one of them came a black Bernard came in every machine gun kit during the Second World War, so there was a lot of them floating around surplus. One neat thing about this is you can put a piece of wire through here and it will come out here so you can pull a piece of wire. Get yourself a parallel uh, jaw pliers. They're pretty neat. I got six of them, of course. There's an extra long needle nose pliers hmm. another one a little bit of a weird shape major brand here's another one that defies its purpose it has a patent on it but no makers name I like them when they have a little spring in there This one is uh, highly plated, so I think it's a cheap one. No, nice little end nippers. Made by Crowder. That was a popular name years ago. There's a very slender one. Another little nippers. Little proto pliers. I venture a guess that some of you haven't ever seen some of these and that's why I threw them in this drawer because they're a little unusual they're not with my 500 other pliers yes 500 at least this is a Kleins everything Kleins made and still makes is of the highest quality you'll notice in some of the box stores if they got Klein tools they're they're locked up in under glass because they're so so nice and expensive very expensive here's another Crowder very weird geometry to that as well no idea this channel lock is a weird one it's a channel lock uh, 407 I like a 410 channel lock also 
and uh, they, they tend to be self-tightening and channel locks are still made in the USA so support that company buy channel lock as far as I know they're still all made in the USA they didn't go overseas and desert us like vice grips did alright that's the end of toolbox 2 I hope that was enjoyable for you this is box number 3 and I believe it's a Kennedy box even though it says craftsman on there because if you look at the pattern of the drawer pulls it's exactly the same as it is on a Kennedy and you know over the years Sears purchased uh, major brand equipment and tools and products from uh, other companies they they really didn't make anything themselves so uh, even though it says craftsman will call this a Kennedy box and this is number three here we go this is my procunior tapping head that I've uh, shown in one of my other videos if you want to see one of these work do a uh, YouTube search among my videos for procunior that's how you spell it procunior and you can watch that video okay we got some directions here on how to make fire with flint and steel I've been doing that with my grandson here's a sign bar 5 incher fowler that was also used in uh, one of my videos so look that up if you want to know a little bit about sign bars and here's yet another one that I used in that video uh, 3 inch one Travers it's a handy size because it's so slim this is one that I just recently got in a toolbox. Uh, it looks like it's shop made, but there's a little sign bar with a hook on it. That might be handy. That might appear in a video someday. There's a hog ring player. Remember those? Along with the rings. I was showing my grandson what they used to do to hogs. Maybe they still do, but we used to use these on seat covers on our old Buicks. I don't know what that is. There's some assorted hardware from a, a kit that I had one time. and uh, This is a homemade, let me show you, in this brown and sharp box, there's two of these. I believe they're called center finders. And I was going to do a video on those, how to use these. There's a brown and sharp in here and there's a sterret. These are pretty neat, but they really are something of the past. And I had made a home wa homemade one years ago. This will appear probably in another video. You can use these on a lathe to, uh, to center a piece that already has a center punch hole. And that would be using a four jaw chuck. There's some little lathe dogs. Here's a set of uh, telescoping gate. No, where are they? Okay, they must be in another drawer. That goes in the wastebasket. I guess that's it for the top of this box. All right, I'll start with the drawers, and here's that mother load of uh, six-inch scales that appeared in uh, one of my other videos. Uh, particularly like these uh, drill gauges for sharpening, and I like the hooked end that some of these have. And they're just all kinds of these. Some of these are major brands. I really prefer the satin chrome ones. I don't care much about uh, the rusty ones. There's brown and sharp. There's a metric one. You know why a man would need this many scales, I don't know. But again, remember I love those flexible ones. Keith Fenner says that he likes them too. There's another hook ruler, but it's not satin chrome. A couple more rules. Uh, some of these are also giveaways, advertising rulers. more metrics there's a brown and sharp, there's a nice thin one that sometimes is useful, well there's a couple of them, one with a hook on the end, I like a hook ruler more advertising metric another hook boy that one's rusty, that's a Lufkin metric I might be showing you a little more than what you need to see here. 
Here's one made in Germany. That's for, uh, lay that aside, that's for uh, adjusting micrometers. Here's a giveaway for sharpening drills. Butterfield was a popular name years ago in uh, taps and drills. Probably out of business. There's one by Cleveland. And we're getting to the last of them. There's another brown and sharp. That one's seen better days. It's got a bit of a kink in it. And that's no good. And I got several of these uh, calipers here. I always like these for some reason. They're really too heavy to have in your pocket, but uh, there's a stainless steel. Yeah, they made them out of stainless. Stir it. Very handy. Inside and out. Here's another little... That's also a Sterrett. That must really be an old one. Looks almost like a combination square rule on that side. Long dead man's initials. Here's another little Sterrett. 425. That'd be handy to carry in your pocket. A little bit of corrosion. And this one's a piece of junk. This is a brass one. Probably made over the pond. Don't care about that. Well, that's about it for that drawer. Moving down one drawer, there's the mother load of telescoping gauges, and I guess maybe I had taken them out of this case a long time ago. These larger ones that are satin chrome are uh, made overseas. But I have plenty of genuine Sterrett and Lufkins in here as well. More than a lifetime's worth. But I, I do find telescoping gauges very handy. I use them all the time. I believe them to be very accurate. And here's a set of small hole gauges. One, two, three, and I think I've got some more of those someplace. When you get under half inch or so, you need a small hole gauge rather than a telescoping gauge. And these are a major brand. Yeah, Sterrett. Sterrett is my favorite precision tool, if I haven't mentioned that already a hundred times. But I'm not going to go through all of these, but as you can see, I've got plenty of telescoping gauges and I think there's some more coming up as well. And the next drawer down is devoted. This next drawer just consists of a giveaway type charts and uh, little booklets and so on, machine shop related and uh, fractional charts, tap charts by Sterrett, Chicago Latrobe, Irwin Hansen, Cleveland, multiples of some of them. Sterrett chart on tap sizes. This is a very good little book. I have several of them. Get yourself one if you can. Well, Morse, it's Morse. You probably will have to find that on the internet. Sterrett saw data. Oh, several more of these Sterrett charts. Another Sterrett chart. Used to get these uh, for the high school, and uh, Sterrett would send them by the hundreds if, if uh, requested on school stationery. Lufkin. I lament the loss of Lufkin precision tools. More Cleveland, and I don't know what that is. Wire gauges. That's it for that drawer. I think you'll find this to be an interesting drawer. All kinds of gauges and so on in here. Let's start with, uh, here's a center gauge, a Sterrett center gauge, and I have to keep this in the original case because if you notice anything different on here, it's a Whit Whitworth gauge, so I have never used it and probably never will. It said Whitworth right on there, but you know that belongs over in England, I guess, but you never know. I don't know where I got that, but there's several of the uh, regular center gauges here too. And you know, if you don't have this attachment for your center gauge, be sure and buy it. Uh, 
because when you're threading on the lathe this is a particularly nice little attachment and if you watch my threading videos you'll see why and where I use that be sure and watch some of my other videos I've got a lot of them all kinds of thread pitch gauges my gosh more than I will ever use couple here that are made in uh, oh my goodness need to throw those away I'm ashamed sometimes when I show you something like that there's a steric and uh, Goodell Pratt later uh, Goodell Pratt became Miller's Falls there's a steric thickness gauge well that's a feeler gauge colored anything you want but there's all kinds of feeler gauges here often used in automotive work some of those are from my uh, shop out in the garage but I have more feeler gauges out there too but they don't use them so much anymore we don't set tappets we don't set uh, uh, points most people don't know what ignition points are there's a radius gauge Mitutoyu brand got several uh, of those and I seldom use them. There's a very rusty Sterrett radius gauge. We used to use this type of feeler gauge to set tappets because they are at an angle. I venture there's some of you that don't know what I'm talking about when I say tappets. But think 54 Chevy Blue Flame 6. There's a brown and sharp Uh, several here more radius gauges hey there's another one of those uh, that fits on here wow I didn't know I had that don't know what that is I've forgot all kinds of other uh, radius gauges here in the larger sizes I sometimes use these I misuse them to uh, scrape fillets in the corner of my pattern making. So I got every size I need there. Here's a couple of uh, tools and they're the, really the same. And I venture a guess that hardly anybody knows what these are, but let me show you. This is a Sterrett, uh, uh, they call it a taper gauge, but it's not meant to measure tapers. It's tapered. See it starts real thin, almost like a wedge metric on one side English on the other and you can stick this into a slot a slot that would be too difficult to measure any other way I've set this calipers for fifth, uh, 50 thousandths so we got 50 thousandths in there and if we put our uh, feeler gauge in that slot I doubt that's going to show up, but it'll come up to the 50 thousandths. So that's how you use a taper gauge. I bet only one in uh, 20 of you knew what that was, uh, because it's uh, it's kind of a rare tool. They're, these are expensive too, very expensive. And that concludes that drawer. At least I had one surprise here when I ran into this.